Do you feel all at sea sometimes? You don't know where you're going, you're just drifting. And the waves can be quite high, can't they? Because I've not been feeling too well today, I, I was reminded of a time I spent going on the ferry to Boulogne um, in a Force 9 gale. And if I've ever been seasick, it was on that ferry. And I tell you, um, even if you're very used to the sea, uh, Force 9 gale in the English Channel will bring your stomach up and down. So are you feeling all at sea? You don't know what's happening. The waves are beating against you. Well, St. Paul was someone who knew a thing or two about uh, being in a storm at sea. I'm sure he knew a thing or two about seasickness. And he knew a thing or two about shipwreck. And when we're all at sea, we can turn to the words that he wrote in Hebrews chapter 6. And I'm going to read again verses 18 to 20. There are two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Yeah. So we may have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil Amen. where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of of Melchizedek. Amen. If you're passing through the fire, if you're feeling all at sea, do you have hope? Amen. Or have you lost hope? Have you abandoned your hope? And if you have, I don't criticise you, it's easy to do. Amen. We need to be reminded again and again from God's word, friends, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. Can I put it that way? Amen. There's a hope for our future. Amen. Mr. Vine in his dictionary defines this word hope in Hebrews 6 as a favourable and confident expectation, a happy anticipation of good concerning the future and the unseen. Are you looking forward to something good? As you know, as a family, we've been passing through a very difficult time. And I've said to my daughter, uh, since the 1st of March, and the sun began to poke out of the sky, Better days are coming. We have to hold on to that. That's a very simplistic way, isn't it, of putting it? But better days are coming. Turning to the scriptures, we can add some substance to that hope. We can add something uh, real to the idea that happy days will be here again. It's not just a song. Not for the Christian. Because our hope is rooted, firstly, in the promises of God. In Hebrews 6, from verse 12, Paul reminds us that we should not be sluggish, but we should imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherited the promises. He gives the example of Abraham. Abraham had to wait a very long time before the desire of his heart was fulfilled. He and his wife Sarah had always wanted a son, and it was denied them. But God had promised that they would have a son. And he waited, and as he waited, he believed. He waited until it was completely impossible, in fact, in his old age. And yet the promise of God came true. Because when God made his promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. I'm sure for Abraham that hope seemed a long way off sometimes. I'm sure through his life experience and all the many errors he made. Do you remember when he thought, or his wife Sarah thought, she could help God out by giving her husband another wife? How did that work out? Not well. If Sarah thought she wouldn't be jealous, she soon proved herself wrong. And the child born to Abraham and his second wife, his, his servant girl, Hagar, did not inherit the promise. But in spite of Abraham's own faults and failings, God had sworn by himself, and God kept his promise. And a son, Isaac, was born. When Abraham endured patiently, when he looked forward, you know when you're passing through a terrible time? It's good to look ahead 
because God has promised better things to come. He has promised blessing. You see, when someone wants to make it clear that they're telling the truth, they take an oath. They swear. I remember the last time I was on jury service having to swear on the New Testament. I swear by Almighty God. And I have no problem swearing by Almighty God, provided I do it in the way that Jesus said. He said, you shall not swear uh, by your head. You cannot make it one hair, a grey or black. But the Christian's oath should be simply this. At all times, I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Not just when I'm holding up a Bible in a court of law. You can take my word for it, Judge. As I fear God, I will tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And God <coughs> swears by himself, I'm telling you the truth, Abraham. I will bless you. How many promises of God are there in the Bible that are for you and me? All the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. So even this promise, I will bless you, given to Abraham, Will you take it for yourself tonight? God says to you, I will bless you. And in multiplying, he said to Abraham, I will multiply you. God wanting to show to us what Paul calls here the immutability of his counsel. That is to say, once God has decided something, once God has said it, he ain't changing his mind. It's immutable. He's not going to take it back. He's not going to say, I will bless you, and then next week say, oh, whoops, <laughs> sorry, no, I won't bless you. There's an immutability with God. God knows the future, and he knows all about us. So when he gives us his word of promise, we can be certain it will not be rescinded. The hope that we have is rooted in the promises of God, and these promises to us are rooted in Jesus Christ himself. The Amplified Version of 2 Corinthians 1.20 has this. For as many promises as there are in God, they, are, they all find their yes or their answer in Him, Christ. For this reason we also say Amen, so be it, to God through Him, in His person and by His agency, to the glory of God. In this very epistle to the Hebrews, Paul takes a promise that was given to Joshua and applies it to every Christian believer. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. Because all God in Christ, Christ has taken away the curses, but he has never abrogated the blessings of the old covenant. They are now ours in him and through him. Why are we blessed? Because he is the blessed one. There can only be blessing from Jesus. And even as we pass through hard times think of this Amen. our hard times are made a blessing to us <laughs> we don't know how at the time but even if it only teaches us dependence and reliance upon God Amen. then the hard times we go through could well be seen as a blessing Amen. Christ lives in us he is the object of our hope in fact, writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1, Paul refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as our hope. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Saviour, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Whatever, for whatever reason, all other hope is gone. He's never gone. He is our hope. Some of the saddest times in my life and if you're a Christian, I hope you could agree with me on this. I have found that the, the, the very, very saddest times in my life, the hope that Jesus is coming back again is the number one hope that fills my heart and sustains me in the most desperate of times. Jesus is the object of our hope. We're not waiting just for a blessing from him. We're not just waiting for... Happy days from him. We're waiting for him. We're waiting for him to do his plan and his purpose in our lives. And he will see it through to its <coughs> fulfillment. 
You say, brother, I'm getting old. <laughs> Are you? I didn't notice. <laughs> there, I got brownie points now. Ladies, I didn't notice you were getting old. I know. Gentlemen, I, I noticed, but I just didn't say anything. <laughs> How can God fulfill his plan and his purpose in my life? I haven't got that many years stretching ahead of me now. Listen, God will perform his good plan concerning you and concerning me. He won't abandon us. He won't forsake us. God has got something better in the future than what we have known. And even if it means our leaving time and entering eternity, oh there, things will be greater than we've ever experienced before. For our faith and our hope are in God through Christ. Since he is our hope, through him, we place our hope directly in God. This is how Peter puts it. Through him, that's Jesus, we believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that our faith and our hope are in God. And if your hope's in God, well, your hope will never be disappointed. There's an exercise I think that we should do as Christians going through our Bibles. It may not be good to hope for things that God has not said. This isn't wishful thinking. This isn't pie in the sky when you die. But if we go through and read every word of God and the blessings and the promises he makes for us, both for our lives now and in the future, then we shall find we will never be disappointed. God hasn't promised an easy path for the Christian, but he's promised he will always walk beside us. He hasn't promised that we, that we will not face tribulation he says, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Better to walk through tribulation with God than to live a life of seeming ease without God. Think of the destination, after all. Our hope is rooted in God's promises, in God's Son, and in God's person himself. But what is our hope about? What is the content of our hope? Our hope is found in the gospel of salvation. Paul calls it this in Colossians 1.23, that we should continue in the faith, steadfast, grounded, not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That is the hope held out by the gospel, the promise of salvation. We were guilty sinners on our way to hell. But a hope has been held out to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. This hope has been preached to every creature under heaven. There is a way of salvation, a way of forgiveness and mercy for all people. And that's why in the armour of God, we were singing a lovely song about the armour of God with Children's Church this morning. Um, I don't think I can sing it without the music. It, it, look it up on YouTube. I've got my God suit on. It's really good. And of course, Brother Chris Palmer, in his Friday monthly Bible studies, will be doing the armour of God with us. And if I'm not here, please do try to record so I can catch up. Part of the armour of God is the helmet of the hope of salvation. It's not the helmet of salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says this, As a helmet... You have the hope of salvation. Sometimes the armour of God, we concentrate just on Ephesians 6. But don't forget 1 Thessalonians 5. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of our salvation. It's wonderful to think, Jesus is coming again. And when Jesus comes again, God will bring with him all who have fallen asleep in Jesus. We won't lose our loved ones. And the most wonderful thing of all is that I'll be there. Yeah. You'll be there. To see them and to see Jesus face to face. What a hope is ours through the gospel of salvation. And of course our hope is a hope of righteousness. In Galatians 5 we read that the, through the Spirit we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Galatians 5.5. 5. And of course... We are justified by faith in Christ now. We are accounted as right 
with God in a right relationship and covenant with him at this present time through Jesus. But what Paul is talking about here in Galatians 5, what we are waiting for, what we are expecting is the realization of that righteousness when we no longer have to battle with the sin in our own hearts or the sin in the world around us. God will bring us to a new heaven and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells, says Peter. And what Peter means is, wherein only righteousness dwells. We will be free from the very presence of sin in our natures and in our environment. To be with Christ is far better. To live with him forevermore, we have this hope of future righteousness. We have this hope of future resurrection. Paul, defending himself in Acts 24, says, I have hope in God which the Jewish leaders also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. We're looking forward to the day of resurrection. It'll be the, the marriage feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, when his bride is raised from the dead, immortal and incorruptible, never again to die. That is what we can look forward to. As we have borne the image of the earthly, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Praise God. It's wonderful to think that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So while we're waiting for Jesus to come, the souls of our beloved ones who have faith in Christ, they are in heaven now with the Lord, but it's just their, their souls, by their spirit that is in heaven, waiting there for the day of resurrection, which is when Jesus comes again. And at that time, body, soul, and spirit will be reunited. Those who have died before us, they'll be reunited with their bodies, but those bodies will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. They shall be like unto his glorious resurrection body. They won't all be little Jesuses, <laughs> We'll all have our own particular character. Do you remember at the Mount of Transfiguration how Peter, James and John recognised Moses? And they recognised Elijah, they knew which was which. We will in the resurrection. Sometimes, sometimes I must confess I feel quite sad. I think that's what happens when you've been in the same church for nearly 35 years. I've buried far more people than I baptised. <laughs> And sometimes I feel sad because all those people, so many people that I've loved and known, they're now with the Lord. What is it that keeps our spirits up? What is it that comforts our hearts? It's the reminder that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in hell. And what of us who remain until the coming of the Lord? We won't even taste death at all, will we? But we shall be changed. First Thessalonians 15, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, or as Paul puts a similar point in First Thessalonians 4, we who are alive and remain shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the trumpet blast and the shout of an archangel, the, the, the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the clouds. This is part of our hope. The future life, our old hymn books used to call it. When we see Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We look forward, as Paul says to Titus, and I've got this up on my wall, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. What a hope we have. We have it. It's rooted in God's promises. It's rooted in Christ's person and God's very nature. And this is the content of our hope. Ultimately, we could describe it as the eternal life that God has promised. Titus 1-2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began the hope of eternal life let me remind you again as i have so many times from this pulpit 
Hope is a Bible word. We mustn't confuse it with the way people use the word hope in the English language today. For example, someone might say, oh, I've bought a ticket, and I hope I win the lottery. They can't be sure of it. It might happen, but the odds are astronomical. The Christian hope it is not a matter of odds. It is a 100% certainty. That's what we mean when we use the word hope. It's something that hasn't come yet. But it's something that we have been guaranteed by God's promise, by his own oath, by his own beloved son, and by his own divine nature that cannot lie. We know that what we hope for in the future will certainly be so. This encourages us, doesn't it? This comforts us. So that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to ever prove false or deceive us. We have fled to him for refuge. And we, we might have mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast the hope that has been appointed for us and set before us. That's Hebrews 6.18 in the Amplified New Testament. Get hold of this hope tonight because... It is an anchor for the soul. Now, I've not spent a large part of my life at sea. When I was a boy, we used to spend a lot of time on the boats. Our holidays would often be up at the Norfolk Broads. And we'd have a power boat. And for some strange reason, they let me drive it. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. And we also had a little rowing boat attached. And we'd just go on fishing holidays for a few weeks in the summer. Uh, and I thought I knew what it was to be on the water. Uh, until I started taking the ferry back and forth to France in gales, as I mentioned earlier. Friends of mine who spent more time at sea have much more experience to share. And one good friend of mine who was actually a soldier and a sailor was being transported in one of those big, big Navy ships. And he said to me what he couldn't get over on this naval vessel was the sheer size of the anchor and the chain uh, that was attached to the anchor. And he said to me one day, he said, you see this church? The, the, the room in which they keep the anchor when the, uh, sorry, the chain when the anchor is hoisted, that chain would fill at least two of these churches. No one would ever go to sea in a vessel without an anchor, whether it's a small boat or one of those big ones. Even if it was the most modern liner afloat, it would still need an anchor. Circumstances can arise when the hope of the entire ship and everyone on board it depends not on the captain, not on the crew, not on the engine or the compass, or even the steering, but on the anchor. When the anchor fails, there's no hope. But as long as the anchor has not failed, there is hope. And this hope is ours. It has been set before us. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. When I asked at the beginning, are you all at sea? We can be blown in every direction by the troubles of life. And we can be forgiven for, well, struggling, frankly. If you're a Christian and you're struggling and you're wondering what's wrong with your faith, I'll tell you, nothing. But remember, you have an anchor. Although our faith isn't strong enough to withstand the winds and the storms, our anchor is. And our anchor is Jesus Christ. This is the hope that we have. Brother, sister, you can't take what's happening in your life. Let me sympathise, I understand. But remember this. There's an anchor that will never let you go. It's got hold of you. The great chain that links you to him cannot be broken it is set before us it says here as a this anchor for the soul is a refuge mm. we have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us do you remember in the old testament when the uh, hebrew people were colonizing the land that they took off the the ites the hivites the hittites mm. and the jebusites and yeah God said that they should put cities of refuge. Uh, there should be, among the cities, 
which you will give to the Levites, you shall appoint six cities of refuge, and to these someone who has killed a man may flee, and to these you shall add 42 more cities. The idea was, for those who had accidentally killed someone, manslaughter was in view here, not murder. A murderer could not hide in the city of refuge, they were dragged out and brought to trial. But if you committed manslaughter, the the example Moses gives is if you were chopping down a tree and the axe head flew off and killed someone and his family was so angry they wanted revenge uh, you could get away to a city of refuge and the elders there of that city and the judges would protect you from the avenger of blood. Jesus is our city of refuge. He says, come unto me all you who labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest or quite literally I will give you a place of refuge, a place of safety. How we long for a safe place. God is our refuge and our strength. A very present help in time of trouble. If only I had known that when I was little. I used to find it very hard going to school. I don't know about some of your pupils. Uh, I used to find it very hard going to school. I was scared, especially of all those people who wanted to call you names or be unkind. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're only four, yeah. um, you'd, you'd like somewhere to hide. Mm -hmm. If only we knew then how to hide in Jesus. Thank God we know it now. I think days are coming upon this country, throughout the islands of Great Britain, where we will have to find our refuge in God. There will be no protection, there will be no safety from the state, from the police, from the powers that be. There wasn't for the early church. Those powers were persecuting them. But they found refuge in God. Think of Peter, arrested on the orders of the king himself, put in jail. He was to be brought out the next day to be executed. And he was in the jail sleeping like a baby. <laughs> He found his refuge in God. So much so that the angel who came to rescue him had to poke him to wake him up. Oi, get up. I haven't come all this way from heaven for nothing. And he got Peter out of the prison. And he led him away back into his ministry. I think the days are coming for Christians where we will flee to God for refuge. But remember, some of us have had a little bit of experience of this. He won't let you down. If you have no other protection, you'll have his. Amen. This hope is an anchor for our souls. How can I describe it? If you reach the place of last resort, where there's no other help, and Jesus is your last resort, then you should be a very happy person. Because he won't fail. This anchor isn't going to snap. This chain connecting you to him is not going to break. We are to lay hold of it. Do you know the cities of refuge, they were set up at the command of God. But if you were in trouble, you had to flee. You had to go to the city of refuge. You were responsible for that. And we are responsible for laying hold of the hope that is set before us. After all, even Noah, he was told to build an ark, but God had to say to him, come into the ark where you will be safe. O oh Lord, we find refuge in you alone. You can remember that really old hymn, quite a showing my age now, aren't I? <laughs> oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly. So sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. There's no shame in hiding in Jesus. He is sure and he is steadfast. We used to go on a bank holiday up to ross on Wye, if it was sunny. And there's a little pub there by the river called The Hope and Anchor. I said, I wonder if they know that's a Bible name. Because that's the only place where those two, well, maybe not the only place, but these two ideas of hope and anchor are brought together in Hebrews 6. We have this hope. As an anchor for the soul. Sure and steadfast, praise God. It isn't going to give. It isn't going to slip. 
It isn't ever going to break. Job says, or rather Job 11, I'm not sure which of the men is speaking. In Job 11 we read, you shall be secure and feel confident because there is hope. Imagine telling Job there's hope. Mm -hmm. But there was. He couldn't possibly feel it at the time, but there was hope for Job. Yes, you shall search about you and you shall take your rest in safety. God has given us this hope and that's why it's so secure. We are anchored in Jesus. Not only does it say, I'll, I'll read the verse again, I'll, I'll repeat that part, uh, Hebrews 6.19, but I'll get right to the end this time. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into the presence behind the veil. Praise God. We sang a song about that earlier, didn't we? My hope, my anchor holds within the veil. The veil, of course, referred to is the veil in the holy place, separating the holy place from the holy of holies. To enter in behind the veil was to enter the very presence of God. And Jesus, at his death, of course, tore the veil of the temple in two from top to bottom. So that the way into the holiest place for all of us has now been made known. There is a presence that we enter <laughs> through Jesus Christ. We abide in that presence, in that holy place within the veil. Our anchor extends even into there. It can't be moved because what we're talking about when we talk about within the veil, we're talking about the immediate presence of God. The immediate nature of God. To abide in God. And did you know we are in that place at all times? Did you know the believer is always within the veil? In the Holy of Holies? When we take time to focus on God in worship. We can be helped by our prayers. We can be helped by our singing. Of songs that glorify God to appreciate and feel and experience that presence of God within the veil and we can truly by the spirit we can truly know that we're there we should have more time to that. we should you know make the effort to do that but having said that I want to assure you you are there all the time whether you're experiencing it in a, a way of blessing or, or not because Jesus has torn the veil in two and now your connection with God the Most Holy is Jesus himself. It's a secure connection. I had so much trouble with my broadback over the Christmas. The connection kept going down. I was supposed to be connected to the internet. I couldn't watch my favourite cartoons. <laughs> because the connection had broken. But my connection with God is not... Um, it's not a subscription with Plusnet. It's Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Saviour, and that connection will never go down. It will never be broken. It can sometimes be hindered by our own foolishness, by our own sinfulness, by our own unbelief, but even then it can never be broken. As we draw near, we'll find that he is more willing to receive us than we are to come. Because within the veil, within Christ himself, we find our hope. In that holy place behind the veil, Paul goes on to say in verse 20, Whither the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And he draws us to where he is. The fact that he's the forerunner means he wants us to run after him there. He was the first to enter in on our behalf to the most holy place so that we could all come and find our home, our eternal dwelling place there. Friends, the Christian experience should not really...